Hello, welcome to another World War II podcast. I had planned an extra episode for you in October, um, but due to scheduling, shuffling, booking guests, the extra has become the first episode for November. So fingers crossed, if I can get the planned guests pinned down with dates, you'll still get that extra episode. I just don't know when. So we've spent a bit of time in the Pacific this year. I didn't intend to, but as it's a theatre of the war that I'm not that familiar with, I've been happy to be pulled down that route. One topic we've skirted round on a number of episodes is the Bataan Death March. And it's been a topic I've been keen to look at, as we have mentioned it a few times. It seemed like an obvious gap in my knowledge to fill. So I'm joined by Jay Burtz. Jay has authored a number of books in the War Stories World War II First Hand series. For these, he collected eyewitness accounts. He's also the author and historical consultant for World War II comics. These are not the um, jingoistic commando comics that I grew up with in the 70s and 80s. Um, Sorry, that's a UK based reference you'll have to let me know what the international equivalents are um world war ii comics tell the story of the war in a straight factual manner but in comic form they are a great way to get kids reading about the war and i'll, I'll put a link on the website so the latest issue uh, looks at the battle of midway but previous issues tell the story of the fighting on Bataan and pearl harbor so jay thanks for joining me let's start with um Bataan. Bataan? Bataan? Ba- Bataan? Bataan? Uh, yeah, the uh, <laughs> correct uh, Filipino pronunciation is Bataan. They pronounce every uh, syllable, but in America, nine times out of ten will say Bataan. I was just at a Filipino event yesterday, and a few people said Bataan, but they're not going to correct you if you say Bataan because it's become so Americanized, if you will. Well, that was my feeling, and I just thought if we give a nod to it, <laughs> um, at least we sort of, you know, we, we've justified there why we're calling it Bataan or Bataan, because uh, <laughs> it has been, you know, it, it's been picked up. So it's, it's a hard fought battle. If I over it for three months, um, and I th- wondered if if we start by discussing why they ended up there, because you know, MacArthur, MacArthur's original plan when the Japanese attack is is to fight them on the beaches. So why does he not fight? them as they're coming ashore which was his plan he'd convinced the americans and marshall to back fighting on the beaches hadn't he well the, the simple answer for that is the japanese had overwhelming air power and awesome sea power and we had essentially neither the small air force that macarthur was frantically trying to get added to particularly in b-17 bombers <clears throat> was mostly destroyed on the first day, being December 8th in the Philippines, December 7th uh, in the United States. There were very few planes left after that time, whereas the Japanese had both sea and land-based planes blanketing, uh, really, the the islands. There's quite a controversy, of course, in what happened to the American planes, which was the uh, U.S. Army Air Forces Far East, in the initial hours, uh, since they did know that uh, the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. But number of issues that happen when you're literally surprised as the United States was, even though they knew Japan was going to attack somewhere sometime, just caused a, a lot of miscommunication, some bad decision making, and most of the planes ended up being destroyed on the ground. The Asiatic fleet, which is the American fleet in the Philippines, had already been essentially uh, sent to the uh, Dutch East Indies uh, and they didn't have a – that story didn't end well. But nevertheless, we had basically punted to the Japanese on the question of the Navy even before the surprise attack. The commanders in the, in the Navy, Admiral Hart so on, you know, decided that we, we can't risk these capital ships, uh, few as they were, USS Houston, Houston, heavy cruiser and so on, being caught uh, in an attack in the Philippines. So they sent them – down south. So we really had very little Navy. Um, after the first few hours, almost no Air air Force. It was a great idea to meet them on the beaches, and there were trained forces 
primarily the Philippine scouts, uh, supported by a few tank regiments of the um, United States Army. And the Philippine scouts were, of course, the United States Army outfit. A couple of other American infantry regiments, and then a lot of really untrained, poorly equipped, poorly trained Philippine Army uh, call-ups that were recent call-ups. So we had ground forces, but the way the Japanese came in, of course, with a well-prepared, well-supplied, and deep offense, it was quickly realized in the first few days after the first landing, first major landing at Lagayan Gulf, that we were not going to be able to hold Luzon. And that's why the plan previous uh, war plan, WPO-5 Orange, was uh, enacted to then move to a defensive position and uh, attempt to hold out until those reinforcement supplies came from the U.S., something that we know now, of course, never happened. But in the initial stages in, in December of 1941, both MacArthur and every military person in the Philippines expected that they would be relieved, they would be reinforced, and that they could effectively hold off the Japanese. Uh, but Bataan, you know, describe you know Bataan and the importance of Bataan because you know to many people who want you know the geography of the Philippines, it's a peninsula, isn't it? It is a peninsula. It's not large by, I guess, what you'd say. Uh, it's it's not Florida or. <laughs> You know, even the uh, peninsula in the Seattle-Tacoma area, it's fairly small, something like a little over 20 miles long and and an average width of around 10 miles. But it happened to be a key on the outer limit facing towards the South China Sea of the Manila Bay. And that was important. Manila Bay, holding Manila Bay, uh, the Bataan Peninsula plus the – Corregidor and the other island defenses across the mouth of the bay that we had built in the uh, early part of the 20th century, that was the key to holding Manila Bay. And the key to holding Manila Bay was thought to be the key to holding the Zon. I think a lot of perhaps lack of coverage of the fact that both what was called the Northern Luzon Force and the Southern Luzon Force, these were the American Army, U.S. Army, or U.S. Army. Uh, Far East Force at MacArthur's command, both attempted to hold out the simultaneous Japanese land invasion from the north and the south of Manila. And they did successfully for a couple of weeks, did a sort of a fighting withdrawal. But MacArthur knew Manila eventually was going to fall. And that was because that was the prime Japanese objective. And that was acceptable because, again, holding the Bataan Peninsula and these islands meant that the Americans still controlled Manila Bay. And that was key because ultimately, if the Japanese were going to enforce any long-term uh, takeover of the islands, they would have to have control of Manila Bay. So we, we tried again, always remembering that the full expectation was that reinforcements were coming. So under that guise, the idea of holding the key you know, the, to Manila Bay which is what Bataan was designed to do. WPO-5 uh, War Plan Orange was designed to do. And that's why they pulled back into that fairly constricted area. But but it did have also a lot of natural features that enabled a layered defense. It is not a route by any means, is it? It is a... I mean, I, it, it, I think it's easy to fall into the idea the Japanese landed and there was some sort of panic in Iraq. And it was an organized withdrawal back uh, to the peninsula. It was indeed. I mean... It was chaotic, but organized. <laughs> yeah, no, it was. It was organized. It was. It was steady, but it was organized. Along the way, the force of Americans and Filipinos inflicted quite a few casualties on the Japanese who were pursuing them. So it was not a cakewalk for the Japanese by any means. Particularly in the, the withdrawal of the Northerners on force, uh, they inflicted. Uh, a uh, number of casualties and, and really slowed down the Japanese advance, even getting to the Bataan Peninsula. Now, I have noted that there was, uh, I mean, I, I might be wrong here, is it about 120,000 US and Filipino troops, uh, and they, they are, are outnumbering the Japanese by three to two uh, or something like that. But you know, it, with that in mind, that's a lot of men pulling back. So did they have food and supplies for, I mean, I don't know how long they're estimated to have to hold out for uh, 
for the cavalry to arrive to relieve them from uh, from the USA? Uh, well, no, they didn't, and that was part of the problem. And again, it was sort of a multi multitude of of sins that caused the great starvation factor and disease factor that ended up being uh, really the enemy defeating the forces on Bataan. First of all, while most of those troops were in Luzon, they, they were scattered throughout the islands, but there was a great concentration was moving towards Bataan where they had been gathering supplies rather hurriedly from other areas, trying to pull them into the peninsula. And they thought they had six months supply. Well, they thought they had six months supply, but they hadn't accounted in that equation the vast number of civilian refugees who also followed the troops back to Bataan as the Japanese pushed down and, and pushed up through the uh, rest of uh, the province of Luzon. So that was a factor. There was some mismanagement of moving supplies. Supplies got lost, didn't get to the right places. And then, of course, there was several attempts, all that really went for naught, of importing supplies by air, by submarine, uh, a few freighters. But the Japanese had effectively blockaded Luzon, and so really none of those efforts uh, were able to make much of a difference. So the supplies dwindled very quickly. The plan of holding out six months, you know, was reduced to uh, a lesser number of months and then was per, pretty much reduced to, to nothing as uh, reinforcements and, and reinforcing supplies never showed up. They're outnumbered, you know, what's, sorry, the Japanese are outnumbered, so what's going wrong? I mean, for, for, for MacArthur, you know, one would have thought they should be able to push the Japanese back or, or hold them longer. Is it supplies that are just the problem? You get a, uh, two factors here, okay? Now, the first one is that the various actions on the Philippines resulted in, by, by the beginning of February, the Japanese offensive in Bataan coming to a complete halt. In fact, they even pulled back slightly to a holding position. They were waiting for a new army coming from Japan. General Homa, in charge of the invasion of the Philippines for the Japanese, basically said, I can't go any further. I can't move against this resistance, which, you know, privately he realized was a lot greater than they had planned if I don't have reinforcements. So another whole army was set. Meanwhile, of course, the allies, the American Filipinos, got no reinforcements. So that was a big part of the difference. And then the second was the supplies steadily dwindled. Because when you are encountering disease and uh, you have less effective fighting force, but those uh, sick men still need to eat. So you're, you're having a, a force that's a lot less effective, uh, ravaged by disease, but yet you still have a lot of mouths to feed. And with, of course, with no effective resupply coming, it was a, a dual enemy, as I mentioned before, both the Japanese now reinforced and the disease slash starvation factor being a perhaps the uh, the greater of the two enemies facing the troops on Bataan. Yeah, and how how, uh, how much was the how combat ready were the the uh, Allied American Filip Filipino troops against the Japanese? You know, there are cases of um, great heroism. We had uh, uh, two medals of honor awarded in the uh, in the withdrawal. There were other instances, uh, the famous last cavalry charge, or other other instances where they, Americans and Filipinos, showed their medal. There were other situations that broke down. You know, the Japanese, of course, were using everything they could. They, they were using landings along the West Coast. A lot of times these were opposed by air ground crews. There were no planes, so they put rifles in the hands of air ground crews and Navy people and uh, other non-combatants, and they were not as effective. So it really varied, but overall, the leadership was strong. The defensive plans were generally good, and even on half rations, the Americans and Filipinos fought the Japanese at every opportunity. But they had, of course, no air cover. The Japanese had plenty of planes, uh, fighters to strafe, bombers to bomb. And so you might say in, in 
against all odds, uh, these uh, forces held out pretty well. And they held out again just from entering the peninsula at the end of December and to the surrender in the beginning of April. Uh, There's three full months. They're holding a small area against an overwhelming force with complete supremacy of the skies. Yeah, yeah. I tell you, we've just mentioned there, and I forgot to make a note of it because I was going. I, it would have been a good question. I forgot. You've just just remind me. Um, the last U.S. Army cavalry charge on was it was uh, on the Philippines. Tell me about that because I'd forgotten to. Uh, that was a that's, a that's a great piece of uh, one of those great. Facts that most people won't, won't be aware of. Right. Well, what happened was, um, of course, in the Philippine Scouts, one of the uh, uh, best trained and most reliable of the units in this operation was the 26th Cavalry, which was a group of Filipino horsemen with American officers. They had trained extensively pre-war. When the call came out, they were among the first to get to the front. They were always in the middle of the battle and in the, in the withdrawal. And they were continuing to do scouting and reconnaissance operations and skirmishing with the Japanese as, as the peninsula was entered. Early on in that process, the west coast of the peninsula uh, on the South China Sea, Japanese were establishing at a place called Longapo, which is uh, later became the giant Subic Bay naval base, and pushing down that side, whereas mo- most of the previous forces had been coming down sort of in the east and central part of the peninsula, but they, they wanted to establish a presence on the west. So they sent a force down. The cavalry had been out in reconnaissance, and uh, it was uh, January uh, 16th when uh, General Wayne Wright um, was uh, in charge of the defense of that part of the peninsula, uh, called upon the uh, 26th Cavalry, and in particular a a sort of a combined force of troops E and F, because they had been scattered out doing uh, these various reconnaissance. So pulled them together and said, "Uh, I see the Japanese, you know, we want to try to intercept them at this village called Moron on the the West Peninsula to try to prevent them from crossing the river. So that was, uh, uh, force was put under uh, Captain Joe Wheeler, but uh, Lieutenant Edwin Ramsey, who was actually in in Troop G, but Troop G had really been exhausted. They had just come back from patrol, as was Ramsey. But Wainwright, who knew Ramsey from uh, – Ramsey was a polo player at the Fort Stotzenberg at pre-war, the big army base. And uh, Wainwright was also a polo, polo player. And, and he, he even though Ramsey was just a, uh, at that point a lowly second lieutenant, he had just the day before – uh, the bombing, had participated in a polo match with the Manila Polo Club. Wainwright was the referee. Wainwright recognized Ramsey and said, Ramsey, you go, you've go. you been out that way. You go You go with him. We were protested, but he said, no, no, Ramsey, go. So <clears throat> Ramsey took uh, and, and we were, and they, they took this force up towards uh, Marone, and Ramsey had uh, about a squad's worth of these, uh, this combined troop E and F, and he was, he was in the, the lead. So they arrived at the village first. They saw the Japanese were just starting to cross the river and infiltrate. These were infantrymen. And so he just decided, spontaneously said, uh, draw weapons, which were revolvers, and just did the basic, classic American Western cavalry charge, <laughs> charged through the village, firing, you know, with the beating of the horse hooves, the firing of the, uh, the revolvers, and just spooked the Japanese, scared them back uh, out of the village and, and back to the river line. By this time, Wheeler had, had arrived with the rest of the troop, and, and the 26th Cavalry then held until the, the, the first uh, Philippine Army was able to reinforce them. Morong was eventually, of course, lost because uh, they couldn't hold that position. It was, it was too far away from the rest of the defense line. But the, the idea of the uh, Putting this uh, scare into the Japanese was, was pretty effective, and, and they, they then cautiously approached down through that village um, later on. Ramsey was wounded. We were wounded. They were you know, back to me. But it was considered the last cavalry charge in, in U.S. Army history because it was the last organized uh, mounted charge against an enemy. And it, it goes in the history books as such. It, it's a great story, cause, and that's the pick. That's the cover of the of the battling bastards of uh, of Bataan as well, isn't it? It's it's a great cover. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely yes, fantastic. Yes, it is. So, thank you. 
I mean, the end comes when uh, I guess Carthus finally persuaded dug dug out Doug as he you know it was at the time. I was finally persuaded to escape. Uh, the American line starts to really crumble out, don't they? And is it Edward Edward General King disobeys orders and decides to uh, surrender? Bataan, is that the? Is that, am I right with the right timeline there? Um, yeah, that's generally the uh, the situation. But there's sort of um, the backstory, if you will. Dugout Doug was a derisive term that the American infantrymen in the uh, in the trenches used when MacArthur was taken out of the islands. But of course, they didn't know what the high level decisions were were being made. It was quickly realized as the Japanese were approaching a. a situation where they could threaten Corregidor, which is MacArthur's headquarters, that if he was ever captured alive, it would be quite a propaganda coup for the Japanese. So in discussions with Washington, and of course, through his uh, his uh, close aide, Brigadier uh, General Sutherland, they were in constant contact with Washington, almost daily contact with General Marshall there uh, about the situation, you know, pleading for supplies, pleading for reinforcements, coming up with ideas. But MacArthur had, when the danger was pretty real, had suggested that he move his headquarters to the southern island of Mindanao. That was his plan. Washington was not satisfied. They knew Mindanao would eventually, the Japanese had already landed there. They knew Mindanao would be threatened eventually. In a way, what they actually did was they gave MacArthur a promotion. Instead of making him in charge of the Philippines, they made him in charge of the entire uh, South sea, Southwestern Pacific Theater, and moved him to Australia. It was not MacArthur's decision to leave, and he fought it to the end. And uh, facts that I uncovered in doing this research that I didn't even know before was that MacArthur had actually planned to continue to command the Philippines from his new headquarters in Australia. But Marshall talked him out of that, said that was a bad idea. We need to give local control to General Wainwright, who had now assumed uh, MacArthur's position and was in command in Corregidor. Left behind in command of the forces on Bataan was um, General Bernard King, who was the artillery head uh, and a very effective officer and very, very well liked and well respected. <clears throat> but he saw by the beginning of April, with the conditions of the troops, with the uh, arrival of new Japanese forces and with the inability to really make any any difference in the situation, that rather than submit to the wholesale slaughter of, uh, of these trapped forces, that, that he was going to surrender. Now, it's pretty much U.S. Army policy, never surrender. That was basically the word from Wainwright. But to say he disobeyed orders, he did, but... Really, in his heart of hearts, Wainwright and, and, every, and everyone else knew that there was really very little choice in the matter. Of course, nobody knew what was going to happen to the forces once they surrendered at that time. But it, it seemed like the most humane and logical thing to do at the time. So I certainly don't fault Bernard. And I don't think later anybody followed Bernard for his uh, king for his decision. It was the only practical solution to try to try to spare more needless bloodshed. Again, nobody knowing what was going to happen after the surrender. Yeah, yeah. And well, how many how many did surrender? On the Bataan portion, of course, you know, was later there was surrender of Corregidor and and the rest of the islands. For the Bataan portion was about 78,000 military forces. Uh, so that was, of course, the largest surrender in U.S. military history. Of, of forces, the previous one being the surrender of Harper's Ferry in the Civil War of 11,000. So it, it was sort of about six times that size, six, seven times that size, yeah. But, um, you know, there was, it, was, it was really actually incredible at that point that there were that many left alive. Now, a few escaped to um, Corregidor by boat, some even swam. Uh, some of the Filipinos were able to sort of uh, melt back into the uh, hills, if you will, uh, people like Edwin Ramsey and, and a few of his colleagues elected not to surrender, and they took off in the hills. And later, of course, with those Filipinos, uh, former soldiers and, and new recruits, uh, formed the, the huge guerrilla network that then existed in the Philippines. But the majority did what they were told. They destroyed their weapons and waited to be submitted to the uh, to the Japanese 
uh, because they really had no other option. Had the Japanese anticipated so many uh, prisoners of war? I don't know that they uh, had planned on the size of the force. First of all, the Japanese did to some degree underestimate uh, the force against them because they did not factor in a lot of the Philippine regulars. But secondly, I think that they thought they were going to kill a lot more, and they didn't. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure the number was, was a bit overwhelming to them. And it looks like they had no really good plan for dealing with them. But then when you look at other uh, actions at the time, it was pretty similar overall that they didn't intend to particularly come up with humane alternatives to the treatment of the POWs. They specifically did not uh, participate in the Geneva Convention and the treatment of prisoners of war. And they didn't show any signs in Malaya and Singapore, uh, other areas, um, Philippines, where they had, uh, of course, even earlier than that in China. They had never exhibited a particular interest in using prisoners of war for other than exploitation, so which they eventually, of course, did in many cases. So it was, you know, of course, it, it varied. There was a policy, and then there were the sub policies of the commanders in the theaters, and then and down to individual commanders. So there was treatment that w- varied, but the the general policy was not particularly a, a policy of, uh, let's say, uh, for example. <clears throat> They didn't apply the same standards of prisoners of war as did uh, any of the forces in Europe, the Germans, the British, the Americans, so on. Not Even the Russians had better treatment of the prisoners than, than the Japanese. So they pretty much uh, were on an island when it came to treatment of prisoners. Um, so anything obviously was uh, possible. And the, the plan to move uh, the prisoners from Bataan uh, to the area of San Fernando, uh, Camp O'Donnell was not well thought out, and uh, it was even more poorly executed. And, and this, and this is what becomes uh, yeah, known as, as as the Death March. I mean, I, I sort of, I had wondered if you know, perhaps you could, if it was even a mitigating circumstance that they. Uh, you know, the Japanese didn't have, you know, they were taken by surprise by the prisoner numbers and they didn't have the supplies. But as you uh, uh, rightly have pointed out, uh, if you look at it beyond just uh, the death march itself, the treatment was the same for everywhere. You know, that 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 is, is not an excuse. There is no excuse, I guess, of, of what is to come um, uh, with, with these men. So, you know, as you say, they've got to move them to you know, it's some sixty miles, isn't it, to the to the camps? They've got to get them there. Um, and how how does the process you know how how does the process start? Uh, you know, of, of well, tell us about the death march. You know, how how do they get going with it? Uh, well, they just kind of crowd them into several starting points at uh, La May and other uh, places along the coast, and just said, you know, go. Now, you know, the, the vast majority, of course, uh, who were captured in Bataan went went to uh, Camp Camp O'Donnell. That was the plan, as such as it was for that that group. Others who were you know, perhaps captured in other circumstances, uh, the uh, patients in the hospitals, for example, on the peninsula, and uh, Corregidor prisoners and, and others were, were, were sent, to, uh, to some cases, to smaller camps, to different places. Some of the Filipinos, it's, it's interesting because much like the Chinese, the uh, uh, Japanese considered Filipinos second-class citizens, uh, and they got the the brunt of the bad treatment, even though many Americans did too. But the, the Filipinos got a uh, more brutal treatment in many cases. Some of the Filipinos were repatriated, actually. I guess the lucky ones, you would say, did not have to make the march. And why, I'm not familiar with what the selection process was, whether there was any rhyme or reason to it. I know among Filipinos and the Philippine scouts that I interviewed, uh, one was repatriated, uh, one escaped, uh, another one went on the march. So it, it was probably a very haphazard uh, way of dealing with things. Of course, everybody was emptied of their valuables if they had any uh, prior to being let go or marched or wherever they ended up. So that was it was that looting that went on. Some of these, at least according to his um, 
post-war trial, some of these things General Home insisted were done at the local level that they were not authorized. But of course, you're going to say anything when your uh, neck's on the line. But uh, there wasn't really any effort from the top to discourage the way that the march took place. And once you were in the ranks, it was uh, sort of like our wildfires here in California. It's just a matter of uh, the stroke of the luck. A fire will come through, one house will get spared, one house will burn to the ground. Some of these uh, prisoners that were on the march they were, were shot for literally no reason, and there was no rhyme or reason to it. If they, you know, some were slowed down, then they were more more likely singled out, unless their comrades were able to, you know, pick them up and keep them going. But, you know, sometimes, particularly the Filipinos, it was just a random killing that happened uh, on a local level. Nobody really knows why. And then, of course, there was the uh, threats to the population along the way who tried to bring water and occasionally food to those in, in the march. And, you know, they were reprimanded or worse uh, if they were found to be involved. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, the conditions are just hellish, really, aren't they? They're not really given any food or water all day. And I think they're only fed and watered on a, on a night. And I guess the temperature every day will be with sun beating down. It would be, uh, and these guys must be already half starved, uh, many injured from fighting. And we just asked to march whatever it is, 50, 50 some miles must have been uh, <laughs> horrendous, <laughs> horrendous conditions. They were the harshest conditions you can imagine. I think that any of us can imagine um, and maybe even we can't imagine how harsh yeah. they were. Yeah, I, I have a, I have a no, I, I, I made a note about it's Captain William Dias, who actually I strangely have a podcast planned on, but I keep kicking it down the road. Um, and he 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 witnessed uh, one of the uh, American guys being shaken down uh, by the Japanese and finds a yen on him. And which which case the guy who had the yen, the American guy who had the yen on him, promptly had his uh, head cut off by the Japanese officer. You know, and as he says, that was that was my that was the first murder he saw, and that was you know at the start of the march. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they were. If you had any you know, Japanese material on you, you were. You know, you were uh, accused of, of uh, looting and, and uh, uh, determined guilty on the spot and summarily executed. That's true. Horrendous. And, uh, you know, the casualty figures. Uh, what strikes me actually looking at the casualty figures? So I, I have you might have slightly different figures. So I'm well, you, you're happy to tell me that I'm wrong. I have 5,000 to 18,000 Filipinos and 500 to 650 Americans from 60 to 80,000 POWs. The Filipinos really did suffer if the, if those numbers, uh, you know, even if you, even if you look at the low end of those numbers, I don't know, you know, how correct those numbers are. Absolutely, I mean, I don't have the exact figures. I think your figures are probably as accurate as any, but that that's the ratio. Yes, I mean the, the Philip the Filipino because it, it, strangely, I hadn't re quite realised how many Filipinos must have taken part to sustain uh, such huge casualties compared to the Americans, because it's obviously the American story is the one that you hear yet. You know, five to six hundred Americans, as horrendous as it is, pales in significance against the uh, f Filipino contingent. Of course, the, the vast majority of those who were in the U.S. Army Forces Far East were Filipinos, either scouts or regulars. So what you had in the way of Americans is you had the air crews, you had the few Navy uh, people that were left, you had the 4th Marines, and you had the officers and um, 31st Infantry and uh, Coastal Artillery. So, yeah, the vast majority uh, to start were Filipinos and the vast majority on the march. And and I'm sure they were singled out in an, an unequal yeah. number. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't quite thought of that through. I, and I find it incredible that it takes over a year for uh, the news to filter back to now, when I say America, I mean the government, not the not the people as a whole, is it? It's uh, the news gets back, and then it's a lids kept on it by the government. Not so much with the the march; it was hard to hide. There were headlines shortly after. I have a, a photo; it's rather uh, well known of uh, a newsstand showing the headlines, so that America knew about the march and the, the atrocities. How much was journalistically created and how much was the truth would 
probably be hard to ascertain because the government was not going to reveal you know all the details they were going to reveal the names or of the officers and men who were on the march and headed to the camps but um I think that the uh, it was hard to hard to keep the idea that the you know, baton fell was common knowledge that the prisoners were taken was pretty common knowledge and um I think through well really through the guerrilla uh the guerrillas and and the sympathetic Filipinos in the island that uh, news got out that uh, you know there was this atrocious treatment fairly fairly fast but of course the government naturally like all the disastrous things that happened in the first part of the war was uh, very sketchy on details of uh, at the outset and for some time afterwards. Um, something that uh, I, don't, I, I, I I knew this as well, but it's something that, 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 that there was only one. There's a war trial after the war, and it struck me that, that I, I, I am I right in saying there's only uh, General Homer who is um, accused of war crimes for the march, and that's. I don't think any of the Japanese were involved. It was just supposedly he was the one one who who took took the blame. Is that- yeah, well, that's an area that um, there's been writing done on. I haven't done a, a, a full research uh, yet because I'm kind of moving towards that uh, period uh, later on in in my uh, writings. But uh, I know there's been a, a, a lot done on the on the trials and um, probably the only thing I could surmise as a, as a theory on that was that first of all, a lot of the lower commanders who may have been in charge of certain aspects of it may have died, committed suicide at the, at some point when the, the it's not going their way, uh, been transferred, not readily identified. It would probably be hard for the prisoners to, to identify you know, certain commanders in the chain. I don't know about the camp commander at what the disposition of the camp commander at Camp O'Donnell was. I've heard his name, but again, I have, my research has not taken me into the full story there. But uh, certainly, it could have been more extensive uh, if they had been able to identify and, and call up uh, evidence uh, on these other individuals. If again, they were still alive. I, I, I briefly read about the trials. I thought this is a whole series of podcasts in its own right because they're politically contentious because they I, I was aware of this but they flew into the philippines and there's some legality reason for being able to do that i think that probably means they can uh, hang him or shoot him i think they hung him actually in the end uh, he was executed um and then there's uh, you know there's the whole how much did you know or didn't you know and the culpability which is quite interesting but somebody had to take the bullet for it so someone was going to get it um and him himself uh, that, 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 that led, led me down a Wikipedia kind of uh, rat hole of looking him up. And he was an interesting character. He'd fought with the British during World War One as a Japanese observer. And he was attached to the East Lancashire Regiment, which is, you know, uh, a, a British regiment in the northwest of uh, England. And I do wonder what they would have made of, uh, you know, <laughs> Japanese guy fighting with him during the First World War, uh, and he's the guy that bit bit, bit the bullet for uh, took the blame for um, for the death march. I, and I thought that I, what a, I thought that was a fabulous, interesting uh, topic that is. But I thought I'd just throw that in because you know, as I say, I wasn't sure if you'd be how much you knew or, or, or didn't. <laughs> but it hadn't occurred to me that indeed many of the uh, officers who may well have been involved. Uh, could well have died in the intervening fighting because uh, it's a high casualty rate. Well, it? you know, um, as you mentioned, General Home, I had you know quite a, um, a record. He, I mean, he was a, a high-ranking, well-thought-of officer. All, you know, what we would probably call an aristocrat. Um, had a beautiful wife, well thought of, a little flamboyant. You know, the second part, of course, of that was that he was long before the Japanese were defeated and he went on trial. He was already shamed in his own country with his own leadership by failing to take the Philippines on the schedule. And he was shelved immediately after the invasion, really put in one of those disappearing officer acts and did not ever really command the uh, occupation of the Philippines. And that was another uh, officer, uh, uh, Yamashira, so uh, Yamashita. He actually was uh, already in uh, in a bad way 
in his own country long before, of course, he was captured and brought to trial and, and uh, executed. He was, uh, yeah, they were not at all pleased with the progress, the campaign in the Philippines. Well, I, th- I might be wrong, but I, I think the Philippines was the slip up in the timetable. Everything else was uh, worked perfectly to time- the timetable. And uh, that was one of the ones, few ones in that early war period that uh, uh, upset the, the schedule. Yes, it was. And again, that's one of the, the major things that we all have to remember when we look at back at the Pacific Theater and, and how things were done and, and uh, the dynamics of how the victory only came about was that this holding action did change a lot of the Japanese strategy. You're correct in every other case from Guam and Wake to uh, Britain and New Ireland uh, through the Netherlands, East Indies, all the way to Malaysia, Singapore, everything pretty much worked on timetable. But even though it was not one of the areas that the Japanese desired most, they were more interested, of course, in the Netherlands, East Indies, where they had oil and rubber and other products that for the war effort. But the Japanese were clearly um, knew the importance of the Philippines strategically, both keeping the allies out of there and also using it as a staging operation, which they did immediately established strong bases there to reach out was called the uh, the octopus reach in their uh, early 1942 takeover of uh, southwest pacific and even attempts to go farther east even even as far as uh, uh, bombing uh, samoa briefly so they needed it and they wanted it and they didn't want it in six months they wanted it in 50 days so that action those uh that resistance of those Americans and Filipinos in the in the Philippines disrupted their timetable, changed their plans, and they didn't like their plans changed. That was something that they were very uh, known for. Once they made a plan, they wanted to carry it out. And clearly helped the United States and its allies uh, recover from the initial shock of the destruction of the battleships, the takeover of islands and other things, and uh, allowed us to move being, us being the allies together, to move rather rapidly towards a, uh, a new offensive thrust uh, in the second part of 1942. And that was really just about, it started about six months after the Japanese uh, had made this incredible and accomplished wave of uh, victories through uh, the entire eastern part of Asia and the Pacific. One thing I didn't mention, but I'd like to mention, because it relates to the upcoming particularly the Guadalcanal and other campaigns in the Pacific, is that everything that was encountered in the way of Japanese tactics later at Guadalcanal, at Saipan, at Iwo Jima, Okinawa, was encountered in the Philippines. The the the, ja- the bonsai attacks, the, the Japanese use of, of caves, uh, the way they uh, planned their defense, the, their use of air cover, all these things were encountered in the Philippines. It's... Uh, unfortunate for the allied leadership that they didn't have more information about that because it, the Japanese replicate all those things later and they became quite difficult things to deal with. But the Americans and Filipinos in the fighting the Japanese in Luzon encountered every single one of those tactics. So if they had not been incarcerated or killed, they would have been a wealth of information for the Allied war effort in fighting uh, the later campaigns. Well, that's that's a good point. I I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, Jay, I thank you. I've taken up enough of your time. Um, if you're an avid comic fan or want to introduce your kids to some World War Two history, you can find World War Two comics at World War Two. Two is I I comics is C O M I X dot com. As I say, I'll put a link on the website. They are a great way to introduce your kids to uh, World War II history. Well, I have no idea what the next episode is going to be about. I'm awaiting to hear back from a couple of people, so it will be a surprise to us all. If you enjoyed the podcast, don't forget you can find me on Patreon, patreon.com slash ww2podcast. By becoming a patron, you have access to little extras that I sometimes release. For more information on how to bring a patron of the show, go to patreon.com slash ww2podcast. And it's a big thank you to those loyal listeners 
who already support the show. With that, I'll stop waffling um, and I look forward to seeing what the next episode will be. Thanks for listening. <laughs>